Okay, hi everybody. And today I've got Kelsey Decker with me and she is an acclaimed author, poet and international speaker who, and yeah, and I've just got her book, her new book, which is Mary Magdalene in the Mirror. It's coming up as a mirror image for me. I'm not sure if it will be, <laughs> it seems quite apt. Yeah, so we'll be sharing a little bit about Kelsey's testimony. And then if you want to know the full story, it's all in here and it's, yeah, really worth getting, yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know where to start, but yeah, do you want to share a bit about your story and like your spiritual beliefs and practices before you became a Christian and then afterwards? Yeah, so hello, first of all, this is really exciting, total honor to be here. And uh, I, I loved praying into this discussion because my testimony has so many different facets to it. And there's, yeah, there's just so many parts. And, and I minister a lot to, you know, just women that are in deep darkness, and especially who are trapped in abusive situations and the sex industry. But something that I don't discuss a whole lot is is my 40 years that I was in the new age witchcraft and occultism. And so uh, being able to come on here and discuss that is so amazing because it's just shining the light in the darkness. And so I was, like you said, I'm just going to give a little part, like kind of focus on that in, in my testimony today. So I was, was born into the new age. There's all kinds that can encompass so many things, as you know. Uh, but for me, it was being born into a community of Christian science. And so that's, I essentially call that like a new age Christianity because they don't believe in the, um, the Holy Trinity. And there's just a whole lot of belief systems that don't align with, with Jesus and who he is as our Lord and Savior. So I was born into that. And then as I, as I got older, I was introduced to all kinds of other things like, you know, Ouija boards and tarot cards. By the time I was 14, I had all these other doors that had opened up through my life through abuse, uh, sexual abuse when I was young and, and other kinds of emotional and psychological abuse. And then I got involved with drugs very early on. And by the time I was 14, I'd actually had a suicide attempt and had tried to kill myself. And so in that I had, I started seeking, right? Because there was just for me, there was no point in even living. There was there was no point to my existence. It was already so deep and so dark. And I had always been able to see into the spirit realm since I was a very young child. So I could see the angelic and I could also see demons, which were much more prevalent that I still see to this day. So, um, you know, I was always able to see into that. And that really led me on a journey of of just seeking more. Like I knew that there was something more out there and it wasn't just this physical and that felt more real than this did. Like all I ever wanted to do was escape my body. Cause I was just like, this is not it. Like this can't be it. And so I sought to do that through all these other avenues, you know? And so I was doing, my mom was taking me to psychic readings. We were doing past life aggressions. Like, you know, when I was a young teenager, the angels, like it was really like these angel readings and, you know, we knew who, what our angels names were and just communicating with all kinds of spirits. And it, and it just opened up all of these doorways that I wasn't aware to the actual demonic and uh, none of this was really of God. So when you do that, you know, you think you're following this path of light. So like, that's truly what I thought. Like I'm following this path of light. I'm introducing all my friends at school to astrology, right? This is like in the nineties, uh, early nineties. And so I'm teaching them all about astrology. We're reading our horoscopes in the newspaper, <laughs> and, you know, all of these things. And I really thought I was helping people and I had such inner turmoil going on that I just thought that the more of these things I could gather and collect, that somehow it would bring some sense of peace. And as you probably know, those things can bring about moments, you know, like momentary, um, if you even want to call it peace, 
But for me, that silence, or I was never able to attain like that silence in my mind that I was looking for because I was inundated, like inundated with voices all the time, like layers upon layers upon layers of demonic and nefarious voices, you know? And so that led to just this really, really horrible, like self image. And I'm just telling me constantly that I, I shouldn't be living. I shouldn't be alive. I, I was super promiscuous that led into me just being really, really promiscuous. Cause you're just free and you're doing drugs. And I was kind of this hippie as a child. And, um, and it all just felt like love, like we're just spreading love. And, and so more and more spirits just kept coming upon me. And then when I was 18, I actually learned a meditation practice. And this meditation practice, it was called the Ashaya's Ascension. And I went to a weekend workshop. My mom called me up. She's like, you have to go do this. Like it changed my life. You have to do it. I said, okay, I'll go do this. And it did change my life. <laughs> That's for sure. And this this practice was essentially, they're like mantras that we would repeat in our minds. And it was meant to just slow things down and and bring you into that place of stillness where you could just watch where you could be the watcher. And so what's interesting that came out of that weekend, a couple of things. Number one, I started having lots of visions. That's when my vision life really took off. So I actually saw myself as one of these teachers. The teachers that were at the weekend were completely dressed in white. They went by Sanskrit names. And, uh, you know, we did these Hindu puja ceremonies. And they were just like angelic to me. It was like, wow, this is who I want to be, right? Like these, these guys have it figured out. So I started having these visions that I was going to become one of these teachers and I was going to travel the world and go live on this property. And the other thing that came out of that, other than the visions, was that I left there and I did kind of do this vow. And was it to some higher power at the time to myself? I'm not really sure. But I I said I wasn't going to take drugs anymore. And I actually kept that for 17 years until later in my life when I got back into chasing psychedelics. But for 17 years, I actually I went off of that because of that weekend. But it really ignited this passion in me, this passion to just want to help again. Like I was out to save the world. (laughs) Like There was just this thing. I just want to help people. I'm so miserable. And somehow if I help other people, maybe that's going to help me feel better about myself. Right. So I ended up selling everything that I owned at the time. I was only 18. I had just graduated from high school, did one year of university. And I ended up moving from Indiana in the United States to North Carolina drove out there and I ended up being with the Ashayas for eight years from 18 to 26. So during that time, I wore all white myself. There were three different colors. We actually had white, red, or black that stood, you know, the white was for purity. The black was for ruthless compassion and the red was for unconditional love. And then we were told that, you know, we were told which color to wear and that was based on who our truest essence was. And so I was put on this path of purity. And since I hadn't necessarily been a very pure person in my life, that that did kind of make sense. But everybody kind of coveted the black, like we all wanted to have that like ruthless compassion. (laughs) But most people were in most people were in the white. And then I actually went by two Sanskrit names. I had my first Sanskrit name was in North Carolina. I was given in North Carolina. From North Carolina, I ended up moving to Canada and I moved it. I lived in Canada for five years. And while I was up there is when I actually took vows, I took vows to a teacher and I had two teachers up there and then they gave me my next Sanskrit name, which is Sri Lakshmi. And I ended up going by that for the rest of the time. So during that, I ended up going all over Canada, kind of doing like you do church planting. I planted 
these Ashaya meditation centers all over Canada and helped like build up our international retreat center. And it really wasn't until after those eight years, after I finally left that I looked back and I went, I was in a cult. I, this was actually a spiritual cult. And there was so much psychological uh, abuse and manipulation that went on uh, in the name of of peace, in the name of peace and love and ascending, you know, basically uh, trying to achieve enlightenment and, and getting to this place of, of like perfection really. And so, you know, I, I grew this perfectionism inside of me that just never, I could never, ever get it right. And I was always just lacking, like always lacking and couldn't quite get there. But through that, I learned how to have out-of-body experiences. I could really leave my body at will. I was having, quote, unquote, kundalini, you know, experiences starting to rise. And, you know, throughout all of this, this deep, deep sexual energy was just there all the time, like just this sexual frustration. Mm -hmm. And even throughout the community, you think, oh, well, this is all love and light. And it was like, no, like it was rampant. People were in and out of relationships. I was actually placed into two relationships, not necessarily that I wanted to be in. Uh, you know, I was told what I had to do, where I had to go, all of these things. So like you said, there's many more details about that you can read in the book, but that's kind of a general synopsis of my, my Ashaya cult days during those eight years from 18 to 26. So after I ended up leaving there, I, which was a long process as well. Like I went through a lot with that. Um, really, I asked permission to leave and I was told no. And so I really had to step out on a limb and step out in really in faith. And uh, I ended up moving back to Indiana. I was living at a center in San Diego at the time. I moved back to Indiana with my family. And then I kind of like what a lot of people do who have gone through abuse in, and you've been silenced is you just, you just, stuff all of that right it just like you put it in the vault and you lock it and you got that key there and you just throw it away so I didn't speak about it for eight years like I hardly talked to anybody about it for eight years people kind of knew that that's where I had come from because I was still going by my Sanskrit name I wasn't quite quite ready to let it go but then you know within a year I went back to wearing street clothes we called them and went back to my English name and then within a year, I ended up pregnant with my now daughter, who's 14. And I had met her father just out salsa dancing because I, I went from, you know, being locked up in this cage, essentially for eight years to let me just go out. And I started drinking and dancing and like, I'm let loose, right? <laughs> it's like, wow there's this whole world <laughs> that I didn't even really know existed to some degree. Uh, Cause we didn't have phones. I mean, we didn't have cell phones. We, we weren't on the internet, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it was very secluded. And so when I was with my daughter's dad, I kind of wanted nothing to do with spirituality, religion, but we ended up moving to El Salvador, which is where her dad is from. And during that time there, I was introduced to Catholicism. And, you know, that was very interesting, too, because especially in Latin America, that's a huge thing. There's a lot of idolatry. And so here's like Jesus and Mary statues and just things on the wall and all of that everywhere. And yet for me, there was just this disconnect. Like I really couldn't see it. I always say that Jesus was always with me, like always. He followed me everywhere, but I couldn't see him. I couldn't. Uh, even with the Ishayas in the cult, we would do these ceremonies every single night. And there was a picture of Jesus on our altar. But he was like Jesus, the ascended master. He wasn't again, Jesus, the, you know, our Lord and Savior, he was just this man who had achieved enlightenment, which we were also trying to achieve. And so we could be just like him. 
So here I am again, and I'm in El Salvador, and here's Jesus basically following me around, and I'm there during Holy Week, which is interesting, which we're in right now, and he, I, I just was so shut down. But then we ended up going, my daughter was having some health issues. And as much as I didn't want anything to do with it, spirituality just followed me around. And, you know, I had already done Reiki. I'd been trained in Reiki at this point when I was with the Ashayas, all kinds of things. Um, And so we ended up going in El Salvador. We went to Guatemala and we visited this Guatemalan witch doctor and it was this woman out in literally the jungles of Guatemala we rode you know three to four hours on the back of a pickup truck and I was the only white woman that she they had ever allowed on their property it spent most of the day just even convincing them to let me come in and we really opened ourselves up to a lot of evil in that place and I knew it I could feel that at the time I mean, I could see these energies just kind of like swirling up in this hut that we were in. And and I just wasn't having a good feeling about it. So they gave us all these things to do for our daughter. And I actually didn't do any of it. You know, take this, do this. But we had already opened ourselves up. And once you do that and you, you're not closing those doors, then it just leaves room for more of those spirits and more of that evil to just keep keep entering and causing so much chaos and disruption in your life. So I was continuing to just live in this state of fear constantly. That spirit of suicide was always, always on me. I was going through really intense bouts of depression and anxiety. So we ended up moving back to the States. And from there, I ended up getting divorced. So this was six years, six years later. Now all this stuff has happened. And, and I ended up leaving my husband at the time with my daughter. She was five. And I got on like this empowerment bandwagon (laughs) where it was like, okay, I now, you know, I've just left this person, my husband, and I'm, I'm going to get empowered. And I had grown up a feminist and that's a whole other thing, right? Like Mm -hmm. my mother had, was a single mother from the age of seven to when I was 20. And so it was like female empowerment, you know, and like divine goddess. And we're just these, yeah, amazing, amazing creatures and, and something, but it was like such, it was so false in the sense of we think we're being empowered and like, we're really living in this divine feminine place, but it's just, it's, it's a mask for this masculinity. It's masking masculinity underneath. And it's like this, this need to have power and control and think that we can actually uh, wield these powers. And so that's what kind of a lot of this empowerment and self-development now even is. Is, it's trying to rely on our own strength, uh, mm-hmm. conjuring up our own powers. Yeah. So it's really, it's really not feminine. It's really masculine then. The divine. Very feminine. much so. <laughs> okay, that's interesting because I was, I was always thinking, what's wrong with the divine feminine? I know something must be wrong with it, but I don't know much about it. But that's really interesting. Yeah. And there's different, there's different parts of that. So. Uh, and, and some may disagree with that, but that was definitely my experience of it was it was just this control and this manipulation. And, you know, people will talk about like a Jezebel spirit, and that's a lot of what that is. Mm-hmm. And that leads into a lot of this sexual freedom that is going on right now in the world as well mm-hmm. is we think we're being free you know people are being so promiscuous and we think oh well you know we just have the right to do this and women oh we're just you know being in our bodies and expressing in this sensual way and it's complete manipulation and so it's in which is witchcraft And so that's witchcraft Mm -hmm. at its finest is thinking that we have the power. It's, it's about obtaining this power. And the greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I was like, wow, 
I have no power. I've never had any power and I don't have power without the Holy Spirit. You know, he is the only one, like the Lord, we have power through him and Mm -hmm. nothing else. Uh, But at that time, I didn't know that. So I was going through all this empowerment stuff and that led into all this, this sexual stuff that I'm kind of, that was a good segue, but I got into this really deep, dark world of, of BDSM, which is like all these underground societies of um, basically torture. Mm -hmm. And so I got into these, these societies and I was doing all of this just crazy stuff. It was really bad. A lot of abuse. And again, it was all about power. Yeah. And with that, it also seems like it's presented as empowerment. Like people choose these roles. And so it's really interesting hearing your testimony and also from your book. And I think another testimony I listened to with Paul Rook, that it's really actually not that, but yeah. Yes. And, and it was, again, for me, it was, it was that empowerment again, because I thought I have my entire life. I had never been for 40 years. I'd never been without abuse in my life in some form. And so here I was being abused, but I was asking for it. Like I could control it. So I was saying here, I'll put myself into this submissive position, allow you to torture me, but it's on my terms. And, and so then it's like, let me see how much pain and how much abuse I can actually uh, endure. And so it was, that just shows like what is going on psychologically, but there's these huge ups and downs. And so, so again, I learned, I practiced how to leave my body again. So here I was going back to almost the meditation where I was in these situations where you're being tortured so, so horrifically that you can actually, you learn to disconnect, completely disconnect from your body. And so here I am leaving my body again, I can even watch what's happening from like this other state, this other space, and I can, I can look down, I would look down on my body and see what's happening. And that's how I could endure the pain that I was in. So all of this, you know, so this is why I say so much the the sexuality and the witchcraft and the occultism i mean all of that just goes together it, it's like those spirits just feed on each other and then those demons that are involved in all of that they're just sitting there and they're just watching they're just watching i call it satan's merry go round because he just has you going from one thing to another and you're just on this ride and it's spinning and spinning and you can't get off like you just can't uh, because one thing just feeds and they're feeding off of you and you're in such a mental state that you just don't even know what's going on anymore. So I started smoking weed again to like try and calm my anxiety. And then I got into doing psychedelics, like psychedelics again, I was doing mushrooms and and all these various things to see if I could just calm, calm myself and, and, and get to some sort of peace again. But the BDSM then opened me up to getting into sex work. And so I was, I was in that for a couple years and more manipulation, more empowerment. And at least I thought I was being empowered at the time until you, you reach a place where you're like, wow, there's just really, this is not it. Like, this is absolutely not it. But during that time, I was living this complete double life total double life. Like I was, I was working at a holistic health center during the day. I was a colon hydrotherapist. I was helping people in that way, really genuinely helping them, but I was wearing long sleeves to shirt, uh, long sleeve shirts to work. And I was covering up what I was doing, uh, you know, outside those walls. And on top of that, I was starting to collect all these new age certifications again. 
So I was doing everything at this point. I was building up a new age coaching career. I was doing all kinds of getting my crystal healing certification, going through a Reiki 2 training. I was doing crystal Reiki, crystal grids. I've done everything there is to do with crystals. I in my life, I've acquired and I had done over 100 practices, 100 practices. And I'm actually writing about that in my next book, like how I opened up all these doorways through all of that. And so that's a lot. That's a lot of different things. And so I was paying for these certifications by sleeping with men for money. <laughs> so it just, none of it just, you know, makes any sense whatsoever, but that's how deep I was in it. And so uh, I was able to go off and, you know, travel and, and do all of these things and get these certifications in this empowering way. So for me, it was like, well, there's nothing wrong with it because look what's happening. So all of that kind of came crumbling down and I, I stopped the, I stopped the prostitution and the sex work and the BDSM. Like I really realized what mental state that that was getting me into. I was seeing also a psychotherapist at that time who I saw for about four or five years. And although I was still doing all that while I was seeing her, it helped me to be able to stay somewhat sane during that time. And she was sending me home with little scriptures on little cards. Oh. And it's, yeah, she was sending me scriptures. And I, I thought nothing of it. I'm just like, whatever, you know, for me, I completely was, was against the Bible, against Jesus, against God, like all of these things, I, I would mock, right, like mock Christians, mock the Bible. And so I kept those little cards, but they didn't mean necessarily anything to me. However, that is the power of planting seeds. And even if that person can't take it in at that time and there's a wall up and the veil is just too thick, uh, too dark for them to see, there still is power in planting those seeds. And throughout my life, I can actually look back and see every single person who planted a seed of Jesus in my life and that he was actually there through everything. So, um, I know I could go on here forever, but <laughs> so after all that, I, I then published a book in 2019 that like talked about all of this and I felt really empowered still. And really that was the point where everything came crashing down. Like right after my book came out, my car was repossessed, you know, just all these things. And I ended up and it didn't make any sense to me because I'm like, this is supposed to be the high of my life. But as you know, when you're inviting all of these evil things in, like you're, you're not going to get anywhere. Like you may take one step forward and then it's like 10 steps back, like, in, you know, and there's self-sabotage that comes in and there's just all these things. Like you, you just can't get anywhere. It's that merry-go-round. You're just spinning and spinning. So at that time, somebody reached out to me from my past that I... I knew from my cult days and he, this man, we were together back in the Ashayas and this man was 30 years older than me. He had introduced me to Tantra and to blood magic at that time when I was 19. And uh, he reached out and was living in London and asked me if I wanted to go over to London to visit him. I ended up moving then to London. You'll have to read the book for what happened in between all that because it's pretty good and juicy. Uh, but I ended up moving to London then about six months, yeah, six to nine months later. And it was in London that I finally got saved. But before that, it was really the two darkest years of my life because I moved during the pandemic, first of all. So there was that and we were in isolation. And I actually was, it was the first time I was introduced. So you might think, oh, well, she's been involved in a lot of dark stuff. But you have to understand, I'm still thinking that like, 
everything's good and we're innately amazing, wonderful people. And if I can just overcome my mind, if I can just overcome all of this, because hell was just a state of mind. That's what I was always taught. You know, there's no physical hell. There's, there's really no evil. It all just exists here. So if I can just overcome my mind, then I'll be golden, which I could never do. And there were so many various voices in my mind that I just, I didn't know what, what was right, what was wrong. I I just, I was so lost and confused. So I'm studying demonology. Like I'm learning all about demons. And my partner was just introducing me to kind of all the evil and the satanic stuff in the world. And my eyes are starting to get open to all of this. But at the same time, I was getting more oppressed and, you know, the demons that were within me were really scrambling to the surface to the point where I started manifesting. I was manifesting on a regular basis. My eyes were completely black. What do you mean by manifesting? So, so manifesting is I would have the characteristics of like demons coming out of me. So that's like, you could if, if you were talking to me and it would happen with my partner and my voice was completely different. Mm -hmm. It was like, I mean, I've heard even, I I think I'd erased them, but I had some voice memos on my phone during that time. And I heard my voice and it was like, Whoa, like that was not me. That was a hundred percent like demons and evil spirits speaking through me. My Mm -hmm. eyes were completely black. Like there was no color whatsoever, like black and beady. And if you do even look back at some pictures of me, I I've posted some, I mean, it's just like, it's completely different. So those things started coming out of me more on a regular basis. And I could feel them in there. The voices were getting louder and louder in my head. I was literally clawing at my head like a demon would, clawing and screaming, stop, like screaming, just stop, 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 because it was so intense. And I just wanted them to get out of there. They had me start cutting, you know, I was cutting my wrists. I I mean, they really were trying to take me out. And then at that point... Did you know then that you had these demons within you that before you didn't know about? I was aware that something was going on, but I definitely was still in denial about it. Mm -hmm. So my partner was telling me this was happening. He was trying to exercise these demons out of me. And so I had actually sought out some help. Uh, from these demon experts that were not Christian, (laughs) that were not biblically based. And, you know, I was like, oh, I need to, you know, have these people help get these out of me. It did absolutely nothing. And so I wasn't quite sure, like it was such a, such a state of confusion. I just wasn't sure what I was experiencing. And I was against this idea that there were demons in me because my partner was so insistent that there were. And Mm -hmm. so there was, you know, and so I'm like, no. And so this is everything in me. It's just like, no, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Of course, once I came out of it and I was delivered from all of them, I could see because I, I felt it. I knew. Uh, so the reason it had gotten so bad is because this is, this is what's even happening right now in the world, right? When things are get to the worst, like things were so bad for me. It's because Like Satan knows, he knows when Jesus is coming. Like, and so that's that battle. And so Jesus was coming for me. He Mm -hmm. was coming. And so the enemy did everything he could to take me out. Like every single thing. I mean, the police were being called on a regular basis. You know, I was being physically abused, psychologically abused. All of this stuff was going on. I had cut myself off from the world completely. I had no no help, nobody to really confide in until, until, (laughs) and again, um, you know, even up until the morning that I was saved, I had been having demonic manifestations. Like that's how close they were at the same time Jesus was close. So the, um, my partner actually had had this on again, off again relationship with the Lord. 
And this particular day, you know, he could actually demonically pray in tongues. He read, like screamed and read scripture. I mean, there's things that you can do that seem very biblical and seem like, oh, well, you're reading from the Bible. Well, there's a way you can read from the Bible. Even even Satan knew, knows scripture, right? Like the mm-hmm. demons know scripture. <laughs> and so he though one night like he cried out to Jesus and he was going through some physical things and needed needed to be healed and he cried out to Jesus to heal him and he actually did the next day he he had this miraculous healing which then put him on this journey of going to church and starting to seek the lord and getting rid of like a lot of his occult stuff that was in our apartment the books all of this and and this man was more heavily into the occult than anybody like you could possibly imagine and so um it was really a miracle for all that to happen And so over time, then I was real resistant, but over time I ended up, I kept resisting, 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 finally ended up at a church one night. And like I said, I was demonically manifesting that morning. And that night I sat in the center pew at Poplar Baptist Church in East London. And the pastor was preaching from Deuteronomy and it was everything to do with witchcraft and, you know, the occult and just all of that stuff. Basically, everything I had done my entire life was in Deuteronomy. And in scripture was saying how if you've practiced these things, if you do any of these things, you are detestable to the Lord, your God. And it was that moment, Kate, like, it's so, it's so interesting how God reaches us and how Jesus comes to us. And it was that moment that I, it was that thought of being detestable, like detestable to God. And I, I'm sobbing, I'm sobbing, I'm sobbing. And um, yeah, that was the moment of conviction. That was the moment that Jesus came for me. And, and from there, everything completely changed. My life changed but it's confusing. Like the enemy was still after me and, and I was really confused. I didn't know if the Holy Trinity existed. I wasn't sure about, you know, just even just anything, but I had some pastors from day one, some amazing pastors that always had discipled me. And so I was, I was going through this discipleship. I was in the Baptist church for a little time, I then ended up going to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and joined this Nigerian apostolic church because I could feel that, you know, the doctrine was just a little, I was like feeling something more in my spirit and, and the Baptists, they showed me so much love and they were amazing, but I was like, there's something more here. I know that there's something more. And so I got, I got hooked up with this Nigerian church and, and I got baptized in the Holy spirit and started praying in tongues and started really getting filled and, and, and had this really intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit is when that began for me. And so Holy Spirit's the first one out of the three that I, I really, really uh, got to just go on a beautiful journey with. And then over time, you know, Jesus really revealed himself. And then, you know, my father, God, or like really revealed himself and spoke to me. And so I've just always had a, a deep, deep, intimate relationship with all three. But through this period of time, I, I ended up leaving both churches because they were both encouraging me to leave this relationship. And I was still kind of hung up in that. So I was on my own for a little while and so much bad stuff was just still continuing to happen. Uh, But at the same time, I was on this like path and I was like feeling hopeful for the first time in my life. It was like, wow, something's going on here. And I started watching all of these YouTube videos about, you know, new age and going from new age to Christianity and what that looks like. And I had to go through that period of like getting rid of everything, all of my books, all of my clothes, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of 
crystals and occult objects and all the things basically from my past life, I had to realize that I was a pagan, that everything I was worshiping, every plant that I had, I was going out and I had an altar outside to, you know, at a tree. And, and I didn't realize that those things were actually super weird. And until I spoke to some pastors about it, they're like, you do what? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, every month, you know, I take my, my menstrual blood and I give it to this tree and, and they're, they're going, like, <laughs> you know, I always had altars everywhere I lived. I always had altars with crystals and pictures and these things I would go out in nature and I would collect. And so I had to go on this journey of renewing my mind and, and just starting to, everything was just kind of unraveling. So it was really confusing. And then I ended up at another, at this conference by myself. And I knew on the way there that I wanted to get water baptized because I kept, I'm like, okay, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I know that there's even more here. Like there was a piece that just felt like it was missing. And so I've been praying to the Lord and just saying, okay, like I really want to be water baptized, but I'm not going to ask for this. Like you have to make this happen. And sure enough, at the weekend, somebody like the, the pastor walked up to me at lunch and he said, I hate a little birdie tells me you haven't been baptized. And I said, no. And he goes, okay, it's in an hour. And it was like, that was it. That was it. We're doing it in an hour. Well, I had taken clothes. I was prepared. And so I went up and I got changed. And then, oh my goodness, I actually have the, the video on YouTube of my water baptism. And it's, it's really amazing to see where I was then to now. Mm -hmm. But I did a like 60 second testimony just saying, you know, my name's Kelsey. I didn't know any of these people. And I've you know, I was been in the new age and witchcraft and abuse and drugs and, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm just done. Like, I'm just done with all of that. So I went into that water and this is why my book is called Mary Magdalene in the mirror, because I stepped into that water. I went down, I was submerged. And when I came up, I was literally freed from every single demon and evil spirit that had ever oppressed me. Every single one. It was literally like a legion of demons. I could feel it in my body. Mm -hmm. um, I could, I could sense it. I got out. I could hardly even stand up. I had to sit down next to the tub, you know, and they're like next <laughs> because everybody's, you know, everybody's getting, and I'm like, whoa, what just happened? I, I mean, it was so powerful, so radical. It was for the first time there was silence. There was just this complete silence and it was the most beautiful thing ever. And I felt empty, completely empty. And at the same time, I was being filled up and I was bubbling. I started bubbling over with this like joy and, and this peace. And, and I finally got up because this guy in front of me was like, aren't you cold? Like, do you want to go change? And, and it turns out this guy was, was one of the pastors there. And he told me at the end of the weekend, he said, Hey, I want to share with you. I've been a pastor my whole life. I've always believed in the angelic. But I never, because he said, I've, I've seen angels, but I never truly believed in demons. This is a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Who yeah. never truly believed in demons. Mm -hmm. Like he's with the church, church of England. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And he goes, until I saw them, he goes, I saw them flee from you. Mm -hmm. I saw all of them like leave your body. And that was just such a confirmation, you know, that was God just confirming to me everything I had felt. And so then I, I walked down the hallway after the baptism, there was a woman just standing there. God had put her there. I slumped. She was just standing there with her arms wide open, wide open for me. And I slumped into her arms. I'd never seen her before. And I just cried and I sobbed and I was hysterical. And, and it was like releasing that 40 years, right. Of just pain and anguish. And I just, I just gave it all right there. Just laid it all at the 
feet of Jesus, like right in that moment. And she whispered in my ear and she just kept saying, you have the power now, like you have the power. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit, not my power, but now I have the power of God. And so then I went up to my room, came back and I, I just was high. Like everybody wanted to talk to me because I was just, I was just on this high and I'm blissed out. It was like the happiest <laughs> I'd ever been. And I've pretty much been like that since. And it, it was just <laughs> absolutely like the joy of the Lord just came down upon me. And it, it was just amazing. So a couple days later, I'll wrap this up here, but a couple days later when I returned home, it was very clear then you asked before if I knew like the, you know, that it was demons that were attacking me and all that. When I really felt it was when I returned back to my apartment in London and I walked in and I was like, Whoa, this is where I've been living. Like it was so, it just felt so evil in there. It just felt like I could feel the presence of the evil spirits and the demons. And I was like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here. And three days later, uh, I woke up one morning and just to hearing some yelling and screaming. And I thought to myself, never again, like never again, am I going to like continue to be in an abusive situation? I will never again listen to anybody scream and yell at me like this ever. And I was just convicted. And then that was the first time I heard the voice of God. It was this time it was my father and it was, it was the booming voice of God. And he said, pack your bags and put them in the car. And I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) Hello? (laughs) He's like, pack your bags and put them in the car. And he just kept repeating that. So my partner left and was gone for three hours. I mean, that alone was like a miracle. And during that time, I packed my bags and I put them in the car and I stood by the car and I'm like, now what? That's the only instruction you've given me. I don't have, I don't know anybody. I have nowhere to go. I don't have any money uh, or not much. And in that moment, five minutes later, this woman who I had known from years before uh, in Indiana, she called me, she called me in that moment. And I, apparently I still have no recollection of this, that I had messaged her the night before saying, I need to get out of this situation that I'm in. Can you help me? And so I'm like, that had to have been the Holy spirit because I don't even remember it. And she called right in that moment and was like, let's get you out of there. So I I went on this journey. I was in London for another month after that. And I got hooked up with this other church there who became my church family over the next nine months. And they really took me in, took me under their wings. Uh, I, I really was discipled by them for a very long time doing Bible studies and doing, you know, monthly fasting. I was praying, doing prayer calls with them. And so, yeah, then, then a month later, the Lord told me to come back to the States. You know, I had gone to London without my daughter. I had left her here. So I came back to the States. I was reunited with my daughter. And about a month later, my daughter was saved. She gave her life to Christ because she had seen such a radical change and difference in me. And so the first time she went to church on Mother's Day in the US uh, coming up, she gave her life to Christ and a couple months later was baptized and now she's on fire for Jesus. And we're kind of this mother, mother daughter duo (laughs) (laughs) who never stopped testifying about how amazing God is and how he's our healer and our deliverer and the only one who truly can save us and, and fill those God-shaped holes in our hearts, you know, that we try to fill with everything, drugs, sex, meditation, men, relationships, food, shopping, all, nothing, nothing can fill that except for, except for God and the love of Jesus. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. It's such a powerful story. And I, I often think feel like when I hear testimonies like that, it, it feels like the further you go into the darkness, the more God brings you out dramatically, like re- mm. with a really sudden experience. And yeah, it just shows the power of God and that he, when you really need him, when you're in that desperate situation, like being in, stuck in that relationship in London, that he will do everything to, to get you out of it. And yeah. 
yeah. so good. It's it's a lot. It's a lot for people to take in. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's just a, he is so good. He's just so good. And so it's just a it's a testimony of like that that deepest darkness that you're in and that he can and will. Not only can he, but he will save. He he will save anybody and and really pull people out. And so I have such a passion for that. I mean, my entire life is is I'm sold out for Jesus. My, my entire life is laid down for him. And, you know, it was like when uh, Saul had his radical conversion to Paul and it was like, yeah. you know, his questions like what next Lord, what next? And I feel like that's my daily thing that I ask, like, what's next? What do you want from me today? And it's also, I want to say it's so important. Number one, I have no bitterness for my past. I don't have regrets. I don't live in bitterness. I don't go, oh my gosh, the new age, da la 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 la. You know, I don't say this stuff because people are just lost and they're broken. And what's interesting about being in the new age and witchcraft and all that is you're actually so close to God. <laughs> you're so close. All of that stuff is just slightly distorted and twisted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had, I've had people say, even on some things that I post occasionally, like, oh, well, that sounds a little new age. And I'm like, nope, it's the opposite. It's the complete opposite. It's that the new age sounds like the Bible because so much of the new age is just, it's, it's a slight distortion and I'm talking slight, like it's not always these huge things that you see. So it's not that, you know, some of these things in Christianity, it's like, oh, well, that's new age stuff. It's like, mm -mm, it's, it's the opposite, I say of a lot of it. And so, so there's that, but then what's so important is after you have deliverance in particular, because for me, I had a radical deliverance. It doesn't end there. And the warfare does not end there. You know, I have such a joy of the Lord and that is based off of the intense warfare that I experience a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had to go through the renewing, the renewing of my mind. I mean, I had to be deep in scripture, deep in scripture, you know, listening to scripture, even on Spotify or YouTube all the time in the background, right? Like these are things that we can do to keep renewing our minds. Even if we're not listening, it's, it's entering on some level. And I, you know, was doing the fasting. I've been really consistent in having the Lord has put people in my life consistently. I should say it hasn't been me. He has, because I've been so hungry for him and I've, constantly sought more and more. And I say more Lord every day. He, he brings, right. He brings who we need and he aligns us with the right people and the right pastors and takes us to the right places. And, and prayer is so important, you know, really being in prayer. And in the beginning, that's super awkward, Like you don't know how to pray. <laughs> I had no idea how to pray. I didn't know how to open my mouth and say anything, the Bible wasn't, it, it just was words in the beginning. And so it took a lot of time for all of this stuff to, to be able to become revelation and sink into my being and, and experience it in a different way. And prayer just became second nature. And most people know I pray, my daughter makes fun of me because she's like, oh, you just spontaneously pray, pray all the time. <laughs> well, that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? It says yeah. we should be pray, pray without ceasing. And I often think that in my head, because I know for me, like I've ceased praying quite a lot. So I've yeah, like that sounds amazing and that you can inspire people to do that and remind us that that's what we need to be doing. <laughs> Amen. And so it's it's really having that hunger and it doesn't mean it won't be difficult. It's been extremely difficult. And I mean, my next book is about all the war warfare, the spiritual warfare I've gone through and the stuff that I've had mm -hmm. to, you know, overcome through Christ. But there's hope 
there is hope in the name of Jesus. And, you know, with the Lord, we overcome, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so that's why, you know, he commissioned me to never stop sharing, to always share my testimony and, Mm -hmm. and to help bring others out of that darkness. And so I go out and I'm part of a strip club ministry team. And, you know, we go in, I, I personally go in every Saturday night and I minister to women who have, you know, that are still in that darkness. I minister to women who have come out of human trafficking and sex trafficking and all kinds of stuff. And it's the most beautiful thing in the entire world. <laughs> just, just getting to share Jesus and plant those seeds and, and watching people get saved and delivered and, and go through the inner healing process because you have to do that too. It's mm-hmm. that heart has to be softened. It has to be changed. You know, there, there's a lot, but it's simple, so simple and so complex, uh, but it's a beautiful mm. journey, beautiful. And with the Lord, we, we overcome, we overcome every single thing, every hindrance in our way. Uh, my last couple of days, I keep saying we're crushing snakes, crushing those snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So when you talk about like the healing that happens after you find Jesus, like, how is that different? Cause like in the new age, there's, like we're always working on our staff and more and more kind of stuff coming up. And I'm just wondering, like, how, how is that different? Oh, yeah. I mean, I taught self-care for years. I did shadow dancing. I mean, I used to teach all of that kind of stuff. And and even, you know, all the blood magic, all of that was like kind of the self-help. And I think it goes back to, again, it's the power? Where is the power coming from? And am I trying to heal myself? Or am I allowing am I taking Jesus's hand quite literally, and allowing him to go take me on that journey. And so he has revealed things at different times. It's not been you know what? Okay. I need to go now look at when I was seven and this happened and I need to talk all of this out and I need to do this, this, and this, and have this formula. Um, my experience has been that when the Lord is ready, when he's ready to show you something, Jesus will show me. Holy Spirit will will nudge me in the right way. You know, one of the things that happened when I when I first got saved was I was told this is a belief that I do not subscribe to. I was told that any time that something, a thought from your past comes out or comes up, if you're thinking about your past, that that's always the enemy because he throws our past in our faces. Mm-hmm. Now. Now that is true. The enemy, absolutely. He uses condemnation. He uses the sin of our past to, to keep us locked in, in these, these mindsets and, and believing things about ourselves. However, what I began to experience was the Holy Spirit spirit would bring memories to mind. He would bring things to mind because I needed to heal that because that needed to be healed within my heart. Mm -hmm. And so then Jesus has taken me on all these various journeys of, of healing different things. And I've had to specifically go in and do a lot of cord cutting actually cut those soul ties. And we talk about that, even the new age, right? They talk about soul ties Mm -hmm. and all those things, but you know, there's good ones like, you know, a tie, like me and my daughter, we have a beautiful soul tie that Mm -hmm. that's a healthy soul tie. But then there's a lot, you know, people from our past, I took vows, very intense vows of poverty and, and giving my life to a physical person, right? When I was in the cult that I was in, I had to, on multiple occasions, go in and go through hours and hours worth of prayers to, to cut those cords. And you wouldn't even believe the things that happen when you do that. I mean, this woman would randomly call me every single time 
and that I would go into prayer around it or she would reach out. And so it just shows the power of that. And again, it's being done with Jesus. It's being done through the, the guidance of God. And so same thing with other relationships, people I've had to cut cords. I've also had to, you know, renounce and, and go through repentance. And, and that's, you know, there's can be a lot of anguish in that. And you just go through different time periods where you're grieving, deeply grieving, even the people that you've hurt in your past through the things that you've done. And so the Lord took me on even periods of time of doing communion, holy communion. And he did that to show me as a representation, how all the times that I allowed my body to be you know, abused and I was beaten with whips and paddles and and rope and really intense things. He was like, look, I took all of that for you. I bore, you know, Mm -hmm. those stripes for you. And, and through my stripes, you are, you are healed. And so every day I was doing communion and he was taking me through this healing, this inner healing. And it was so beautiful. And then I was drinking that wine every day. And I mean, this was like 5am every morning and I was drinking that wine, his blood. And that was to dissolve any blood covenants that I had entered into in my life. I had done blood magic. I've allowed people to drink my menstrual blood. I have drank blood myself. I have, you know, I mean, this stuff is not to be taken lightly at all. And so Mm -hmm. I had to go in and, and he showed me that by, by doing that, like that he was purifying me. And that I was drinking royal blood and he showed me like, this is royal blood and you are now royalty. You are in the kingdom of God and my blood, he he would say this, you know, this is the only true blood. This is true blood. And so, you know, that's just been my personal journey and the, and the things that he's taken me on. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people, if you don't trust that you're hearing the word of God or that he's, he's really leading you to do something. um, I think that's what it's been for me is that, you know, it can be a really uh, small, still voice, but when I get a prompting to do something, Mm -hmm. I do it and it's obedience. And it's through the obedience of being willing. Like when he said, pack your bags and put them in that car. And I did it and I was obedient and he saw like, wow, she's willing to step out in faith. I had nothing. I gave up everything I'd ever known my entire life. I had, I had nothing when I got back to Indianapolis, one suitcase, you know, and I lived out of that for nearly a year. And I mean, I lived in a hotel, like it's just been a complete, complete faith walk. I I was stripped. The Lord stripped me bare. (laughs) And I say in the book, anything that I had left from the enemy, because the enemy stole everything from me. He stole, he stole everything. And what he didn't take, I said, the Lord took, but it's not out of punishment. Like he took what wasn't for me. He took that relationship. He took all of those practices. He took it all because he just wanted to fill me back up with him. And so he took over and now he is the one who's in control of my life. I am now in chains. I am chained (laughs) to my savior. You know, I am in bondage to him. I am his servant. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's another whole book. I've got like hundreds of books he's put on me. Um, You know, that's Mm -hmm. another whole one because now I am, you know, just truly, truly chained to him. And it's like, Lord, what do you want with me? Uh, What do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve you? And um, so it's just amazing. Yeah. (laughs) So inspiring. Yeah. To hear and just like, yeah, how you're listening to like what God's telling you, like with the communion and stuff. And yeah, I was, it's funny. I was just thinking the other day that sometimes with my daughter, I use the festivals as an excuse, you know, like we're coming up to Easter because she kind of gets into it if it's around a festival. So I was like, I think I want to get some busy grape juice and do the communion at home. So yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. 
Yeah. And it's so, it, it is powerful to do. And, and it's funny how for a long time I was doing like non-alcoholic, um, like, you know, wine or grape juice or something like that mm-hmm. during that time. And then again, leading of the Holy Spirit, I don't drink, but he had me actually use wine. And he said, there's power in the bitterness mm-hmm. because oh, there okay. it's bitter. And there was something represented around that bitterness of taking it. So it's just mm-hmm. amazing the stuff that he reveals and, you know, just the way that he works. And, and I just always say, don't put God into a box. Like don't put him in a box. Like mm-hmm. people don't understand how I still had demons in me and the Holy spirit in me at the same time. And they'll say, well, that's mm-hmm. not right. That's not biblical. That's not, and I'm like that, that's my experience. I can yeah. tell you <laughs> yeah. that was my experience. And so nobody can tell me like who God is like, that's, that's who he is for me. And, and, and he's miraculous and, and he makes a way where there is no way always. And uh, he shatters every box that we can put him in every single box. And so I think a lot of times when you're leaving the new age and witchcraft stuff as well, it's, you can be really hesitant to have anything to do with the supernatural God. And, you know, I, I got on that for a little time where I, I was following apologetics in the very beginning because I needed to understand with my mind first, I had to understand who this Jesus fellow was. I was just Mm -hmm. like, who are you? And so I was watching the chosen. That was like one of the first things I watched because I just needed to know some basic stories of who Jesus was. And so he used, the Lord used the chosen. He used uh, a case for Christ. And I know you've written about that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these things to satisfy my mind, to help me come to uh, an understanding in that way before my heart could really catch up, before it would become this revelatory experience. And then and then over time, it, it changed. And I think that's what's so important to highlight, too, is instead of bashing and saying, oh, don't follow that person. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's understanding that God will use anybody. He will use anybody. He used somebody who abused me to bring me to Christ. He will use anybody. And even in, within the kingdom, within, you know, different pastors and speakers and leaders, I may not listen. I don't listen to any of the people that I listened to in the first couple of months, but they were who I needed at that time. And it's not about them being wrong. It's that they are speaking to whomever they are supposed to be speaking to. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just have respect for, you know, everybody has a part to play and I just have the utmost respect for that. And um, like I said, I followed the Baptists in the beginning until I realized, well, they don't believe in, you know, all this power of the Holy Spirit. And, and I know that now as an experiential thing. So I had to move on, right? I had to move on from that. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't agree with them. Doesn't mean I don't love them. I love those people. You know, they, they were instrumental. Um, but it was just, it was just time to move on. So I think we really need to respect where people are at and where they're at on their walks and, and just, just allow people to be led more by, by the Holy spirit and by God. And, um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, and I go to a Baptist church, actually, because um, <laughs> <laughs> there's not so much choice around here in Italy. But I do, like you say, I do really love my church. And um, and I also find it really helpful to learn from people like you because you are so alive in the spirit. And um, one, of, one of my friends that I met at my church, she was saying how she thinks that all the demon denominations it's like together they make up a whole so you have the baptists that might be really like strong on the bible and then you have the pentecostal that are really strong with the holy spirit and it's kind of all part of god's plan so it might be that we might criticize this one for not being quite right but but yeah like together it's it's all part of the plan so yeah it makes total sense and yeah 
Oh, I absolutely love that because I think we get, we get trapped into finding the perfect church as well. Like we're, we're always trying to find the perfect church, but that's mm-hmm. been my experience too, is when I've been with one, it's like, oh, they're super, oh, it's like, we're, we're super in the Bible. Like, and it's like deep and it's just feels so good. Right. But then I was like, wow, I'm, I really am wanting to learn and kind of get more into the prophetic and, and follow, you know, the Holy spirit and stir that up a little bit. And so then the Lord led me to like, you know, another church, but then I'm going, Oh, wow. Well, I really want to get back in some Bible study now. And so, (laughs) right. And so, but it's just trusting that he has us where we, you know, where we're meant to be in every season too. And Mm -hmm. that that's made me also have to then really be in the Bible on my own in this season and, and get into that and, and have it playing in the background. This morning, I was back doing that again. I was like, you know, I'm now in a season where I need to start having scripture playing in the background, you know, all, Mm -hmm. all day. And especially this morning, I told you before we got on, I knew this was powerful. I knew that our talk was going to be powerful because this morning I I could feel the enemy as soon as I woke up, like he was just causing (laughs) destruction, like not destruction. He was causing distraction and just all these little things. And I was like, "Mm -hmm." I was like, yeah, like chains are about to be broken today in the name of Jesus. (laughs) And when we share our testimonies and testify on the goodness of God, like the enemy doesn't like that. So, so this has been powerful. And I just pray that who, whomever, you know, is led to listen to this and, and listens to this, you know, just that they come to some revelation of, of a deeper intimacy with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus, and, and just continue on that beautiful walk and see that no matter how dark, you know, things have been, no matter what you've done in your life, there is absolutely no condemnation in Christ. There is no condemnation. And, and your past has just made you who you are. It's made you to be a more powerful uh, voice for God. Like it, it has, you know, he uses everything. There is no time wasted with him. Nothing. He redeems every single thing. I mean, look how he's redeemed sex work by taking me into strip clubs. Like I wasn't asking for that. He led me there and, and onto this ministry and, and to get to minister to women. That is the ultimate redemption. So whatever has happened in anybody's life that has been dark, um, or you may have this shame, like stuck and bound by these shackles of shame, like the Lord will use it and he will redeem it all for his glory because he wants, and he deserves all of the glory. Wow. And I just thank you, Kate, for being obedient, you know, and you've got your YouTube channel and, and doing, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, thank you. That's so inspiring. And I think it's really helpful because I know like when I'm talking online with people that are maybe in the new age, that they have this idea of Christianity as being like really non-spiritual, like quite boring. And I just think that when people hear from you, like what it really means to like live guided by the Holy Spirit and with a real relationship with God it it just shows like what this is it's it's not like a religious thing about you know rules and man-made control it's really about following God and yeah so hopefully that comes through to everyone yes it's so fun (laughs) like like there's nothing better than the pure joy of the Lord and I mean he it, it does it makes life so exciting so exciting. And this is, I can truly say this past week, I've had a deeper revelation of that, of being hopeful, like truly, truly hopeful. Uh, and, true. you know, yeah, a yeah, lot of people it's have so, said. Yeah, it's, it's so inspiring reading your posts as well, because I remember you put something up about books. And I know for me, like, I've written one book before and I often think, oh, well, we're coming to the end time. So I haven't got time to write a book. (laughs) And then I saw your post and I'm like, oh, maybe there's hope. Like there's time. (laughs) So you were inspired. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed watching this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Be blessed.